Hey gang, so today we're going to be making the snake game. We started making the snake game on Saturday and we didn't quite get completely finished with it. Um, this video, this stream is going to take us to that point where we basically finished off and then maybe I'll continue going a little bit, maybe I'll make another video, uh, we'll see, um, to finish up the snake game. First off, let's make sure we know what we're talking about. So if you just Google for snake game, conveniently Google has this game built right into Google. So I can click to play and can use my arrow keys to navigate this little snake around, eat the apples and it makes my snake get a little bit bigger. And then I can do that. Woo. Okay, and then when I run into myself, oh no, I died, game over. Okay, so that's basically what we're gonna be making. Um, I've already created a bit of a basic framework for this, um, which we'll get to in just a second. I want to first talk about some of the stuff that we need to do in order to make this work. So give me just a second to pull this up really quick. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. Sorry, I've got to find the thing. Okay, hey, I'm back. So, um, first thing we need, if you take a look here, we've got a lovely frame, nice background. It's got a grid of cells that the snake can be in. Um, we've got a couple of other elements that are involved, such as the snake itself. Notice the snake, it takes up several of those cells and it moves continuously. And then you have the apple, which takes up one cell, and as soon as you eat an apple, another apple appears in a random place. Okay, so we got that. Um, <sighs> let's see, what else? We've got to be able to um, make the snake move. So the snake needs to have a specific direction that it's going. Um, and that direction is always going to be in a straight line going left to right or up and down, but never diagonal. I can't make him go diagonal. He's always going left to right. Okay. Um, and I need to be able to control that with the arrow keys. And yeah, that's basically it. Um, to get started, I'm going to use a, a base frame that I've already created, like I said. Uh, here's the link right there. So I'm going to leave this on the screen for a bit. You can go ahead and pause this video, type that in, and then um, hit play again. Or I'll make sure that this link ends up in the video description. Um, in fact, we'll take care of that right now. Boom. Yeah, and if you have any questions, feel free to send any messages to um, the stream itself or Discord or whatever. And then if you're watching this later, you can ask questions on Discord and then somebody will be able to answer you there. Okay, so let me just open up this link now. Um, yeah, go away. And here we go. Let's take a quick look at this really quick just to make sure that we're clear. We've got this box here, um, which I'll talk about what that box is in a second. And then we have this H1 up here at the top, which is colored and then everything's centered on the page. So you can go ahead and look at the CSS that makes it so that all of this happens. Um, you'll see here that the box with the border is actually an HTML element called Canvas. Canvas allows you to be a JavaScript artist, okay? You have the ability to change the color of any one of the pixels inside of this box. So that means I can make it look however I want. Um, if you want to see some really cool demonstrations of what you can do with Canvas, just go to CodePen and search for JavaScript Canvas or just Canvas, and you'll come up with a lot of really cool stuff that people have made with Canvas. Um, for our purposes, we're gonna be using this to draw where the snake is at any given moment, okay? Um, and then I have my JavaScript here. That's where we're gonna be focusing today is on the JavaScript. So you can see here the canvas is actually being created in JavaScript with document.createElement, okay? Now remember, with our snake game, we have a grid, 
that's divided up into cells. You have a certain number of cells, uh, a certain number of columns, and a certain number of rows of cells. So we need to define what our cells are looking like. That's what these right here are for. We have cell width and cell height. That is the height and the width of the boxes for the cells. And then we have the number of rows and the number of columns going across and going down, or going down and going across, okay? Um, I'll talk about CTX and delay in just a second. Um, then we have these three things here. Now, if you're not familiar with JavaScript, they might look a little funky. Here we have variables, and we're just setting those variables to be numbers, okay? Here, though, we're using something called an object to define our apple and to define our direction. And then we're using something called an array to define our snake cells. So really quickly, an object, which is this right here, it's something that holds properties. Um, so for example, if I had an object that was a car, the car would have a year, which would be a number. It would have the type of engine that it is, um, and that would be like a string or maybe another object. Um, it would have the number of seats. It would have the miles per gallon. All of those are properties of the car. So I could define that by going var car equals um, year 2002 make Pontiac and uh, seats 5. Okay, so I'm able to put all of this information into a single variable. That makes it really easy for me to keep track of that information and what it relates to. So then if I want to get information out of the car, I could use car dot and then whatever key, these, are, these here, these labels are called keys. So I can get the information based on the key. So car.year is going to be 2002. I can also change the numbers. So if I happen to add another seat to my car magically, I can go car.seats equals six. Or I could even do car.seats equals car.seats plus one. Or I could, yeah, that's, that's good enough. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing for the apple here. Instead of defining um, what type of apple it is, we really don't care. It's just going to be a red apple. What we do care about, though, is where it's located on this game board. So I'm going to change this to be um, two properties. One of them is an X, which is the horizontal direction. It disappeared for a second. It'll be back, though. And I'm just going to set that to zero. And then we have a Y, which is the vertical, which is also zero. Um, typically in algebra, when you have, hang on a second. Um, in algebra, where, when you have graphs and such, the X goes from left to right, right? And the Y goes from bottom to top. Um, in this case, though, it's quite the opposite. It does still go from left to right on the x, but the y goes from zero being here to um, the positive being here. So uh, that's just something to keep in mind. Okay, so that's the apple object. And then we have the... Oh, I've got to make sure I hit the save button. Then we have the um, direction. This right here is just keeping track of which direction the snake is going. Um, I'll get to that later. And then we have the snake cells. This is an array. Okay, Arrays are lists. So suppose I wanted to have a list of um, favorite fruits. I could have A list that looks something like this apple and orange and grapefruit and uh, banana. Okay, 
And so that's a, a, an array. Oh, that's an object, actually. I did that wrong. You want to use the straight brackets for arrays. So that is an array of strings, an array of words. Okay. Um, suppose, though, that I wanted to make this a little bit fancier and have an emoji with each of these. I could actually change all of these to be objects, or I could even just change one of them to be an object. So in this case, I'll change apple to be an object. And the name of the fruit is obviously apple. And then if I wanted to have an emoji, I could do that as well. And just so everybody knows, emojis are strings. And then I can put that in there. So now I have an object inside of my array with a name and the emoji. If I wanted to get something out of the array, I could get it with the number that it is in the array. So let me actually paste this into my console so we can play around with it for a bit. Oh, hang on a second, there we go. So now I can do fruits and it lists out my, my great array there. Um, so if I wanted to get the first item, you'd think that I would do fruits one but actually that's going to give me the second item, orange. Um, arrays start at index zero. That's the, the very first item is at zero. So if I wanted to get that apple, I'd have to do fruits zero like that. Okay. And then if I wanted to know how many fruits were inside of my array, I would do fruits dot length. And that just counts up the number of fruits or whatever is inside of my array and gives me that number. Finally, suppose I wanted to add another fruit to my array, like kiwi, I can easily do that with a command called push. So I can do fruits.push, and then I can put in my fruit kiwi. And now if I do fruits like that, it shows me that kiwi has been pushed to the end of my array. Awesome. So now that we know what arrays and objects are, we can move on to actually doing some stuff. Um, the very first thing we need to do is, well, I don't know. There are a lot of things that we could do first. Um, but the most obvious to me is making it so we can actually see what's, so actually do something here on our game board um, so that we can see what all the other stuff that we do in the future is. So I've created a couple of functions here that do things like we have a place apple that's going to put an apple onto the screen. We have place snake that is going to place the very first cell of the snake on the game board. Then we have fill square. What this does is it places a, uh, a, a square on the game board where we tell it to. So this function has three arguments, x, y, and color. So the x and the y are the location on the board that we want to fill in, and then the color is just the color we want to fill in. Okay, awesome. Um, finally, down here I have an init function. Init stands for initialize, and it basically takes care of putting together all of the stuff um, at the very beginning of the game. So before anything else starts, we want to put it all together so that it's there. So the first thing we do is we create, well, up here we created our canvas already. Here we're setting the width and the height of the canvas, and we're making it so that it's the width of the cell width times the number of cells, so it gives us all of the cells there, and then the same thing with the height. This command takes our canvas and it sticks it onto the DOM, or the, the actual web page, so we can see it. So instead of being just in JavaScript, it's actually displayed on the web page. In order to do anything in, um, on the canvas, we have to have something called a context. The context is something that gives us all of the commands, all of the instructions necessary in order to draw whatever it is we want on the canvas. So we have to get the context from uh, the canvas, and we're going to store that in the CTX variable that we called up here. And then we have these function calls for placing the apple, placing the snake, and draw. Those are going to happen at the very beginning of the game before anything else so that when the game starts you already have the apple and the snake there waiting to go. And the draw function is going to take the locations of the snake and the apple and place them, like draw them, on the screen using our fill square 
function. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm gonna make one little change really quick. If you already have forked this or gotten to this part, take the init call and we're actually gonna move it up right here. That's gonna make things a little bit easier later. Okay, so um, let's do our fill square function. We need to figure out how to draw a rectangle on the canvas. So why don't we do that? Let's look that up. I'm gonna go to Google and I'm gonna type in canvas draw rectangle. And whoa, look at this. I have a couple of uh, things that I can look at. Um, awesome. This right here tells me I can use this rect method with the CTX variable in order to draw a rectangle and I have to use the stroke or the fill method to actually draw it. So what I'll do is I'll create the rectangle and then I'll do the um, stroke or fill method and then that will actually draw it. There's actually another thing um, that I think works a little bit better and that is the fill rect method. What this does is it just automatically fills it in without me having to do the fill function. So I'm gonna do that. Um, let's come over here and in our fill square, we're going to use that ctx.fillRect function. The first argument is the x location that we want to fill, like start our fill in. So I'm gonna make that x. The second is the y. And then the third and the fourth is the width and the height. Now, since we're always going to be drawing cells, whether they're snakes or whether they're apples, we always want them to be the size of the cell. So let's make this one cell width and then this one cell height, okay? Now there's one thing that we're missing. We've gotta be able to set our color somehow. So here it shows us, if I go down to, oh, Oh, it's not here. Oh no. Right here. Use the fill style property to set a color gradient or pattern. So let's change the fill style to be a color. And that's going to be the color that we specify here. So ctx.fill style. And that's just going to be, oh, hang on. I do equals color, right? See, it's perfectly fine to look at documentation if you forget something. Um, so that should take care of it. It's going to set the fill style to our color and then it's going to fill in um, where we want. So let's test this out really quick. Remember this is going to be on our grid. So make sure that whatever number you type in is less than 15. Just type in the name of the function, fill square, and then two coordinates. So I'll do three, eight, and then a color. Make sure this is a string. So put it in quotation marks. And, uh-oh, <laughs> what it did is it put it at 3,8, but I didn't make it move over um, based on the cell width and the cell height. So I actually need to do that. Right here, for the x and the y, we need to multiply this by cell width and multiply the y by cell, oops, times cell height. And that way it's actually going to be in the correct location uh, based on the cells themselves. Okay, so now that I've done that, um, let's place, well, let's, let's uh, yeah, let's place an apple. Well, let's draw the apple first. Down here I have the draw function. The purpose of this function is to draw all of the stuff that's supposed to be on the page. Okay, so it's gonna draw the apple where it belongs, it's gonna draw the snake where it belongs. So let's start by drawing the apple. We already have the apple's location right here. And so I can run, let me put a comment in here, draw the apple. I can run fill square, and the first argument is going to be the apple's x, so apple.x. The second argument is gonna be the apple's y, so apple.y. And then the third is going to be the color. In this case, my apples are always going to be red. And now, hey, it drew the apple right there at zero, zero. Here's the thing though. If we were to have the apple at the same uh, location at the beginning of every game, that would be lame. 
So instead, we're going to place the apple in a random location uh, at the very beginning of the game. And that's what we're going to do with this function. So, as you recall, we can set properties on an object by just setting them equal to whatever we want to set them to. So I could do apple.x equals 8 and apple.y equals 8 and then it moves over there. Hooray! I want to make it random though. Fortunately, JavaScript provides us with a random number generator. The thing about it though, it's a math.random. When I run it though, it gives me a decimal anywhere from 0 to 1. But I don't want it to be from 0 to 1, I want it to be from 0 to 15. So what I need to do is first multiply this number by 15 and then it'll give me a number from 0 to 15. So math.random times 15. Oops. And now it's going to give me a number between 1 and 15. Awesome. But I also need to round it. So there's another function that lets me round stuff. That's math.round. And now it's going to give me a regular number between 1 and 15. Awesome. Let's come over here to place apple and change the x and the y to this function. But we want to make sure we change the 15 from being 15 to being the cell uh, rows. Nope, hang on. Cell calls for the x and cell rows for the y. The reason we want this to be cell calls and cell rows is so that uh, we can change this number up here whenever we want and it'll automatically update the place apple function to place the apple somewhere inside of our cell rows and cell columns. I just dropped something. Hello. Okay. Um, great. Now every time we run this, and you can run it by just changing the code somewhere, um, like if I were to get rid of this function, the apple's going to appear in another random place. Sometimes it's even going to disappear because, oh, actually, yeah, um, it's going to disappear because of a bug. We'll get to fixing that bug in just a bit. But now we have an apple being placed on the screen. Let's do the same thing with the snake. The snake is going to be a little bit different from the apple because remember, the snake takes up multiple cells, right? Since it takes up multiple cells, we need to um, keep track of all of the cells that it is inside right now. It's going to be a list of locations. That's why snake cells is an array instead of an object, because we're going to put objects inside of that array. So to start off with, let's create our first object that's going to go inside of that array. We're going to be in the place snake function. And I'm going to type in var snake equals an empty object. And then we're going to set the x and the y values of that object. So snake.x equals, and we're going to use the exact same stuff we used up here, because we're just going to place it somewhere random, and then snake.y equals, and then do the same thing. And then finally, we need to put our snake into the snake cells. So snake cells dot push snake. Oh, we're not seeing anything because we're not drawing the snake yet. So let's draw the snake. Drawing the snake is going to be a little bit trickier than drawing the apple because instead of drawing just one square, we need to draw many squares. To do that, we're going to do what's called a loop. A loop does the same thing over and over again with slightly different parameters, okay? In this case, we want to loop over all of the items inside of our snake cells array. So we already know the length of the array by going var um, array length equals snake cells dot length. What we need is a variable to tell us what cell we're currently drawing. 
To do this, we are going to use a for loop. So to do a for loop, you just type for, and then open parentheses, and then you need, need to create that variable to keep track of what item in the array we're working with. So var i equals zero. We're gonna start at the zero item in the array. i is less than array length. This means we're gonna keep on looping until um, we've gotten to the end of our array. Okay, so array length is going to be the last item in the array. And then the last thing is i++. This means at, um, at the end of doing all of the stuff inside of this for loop, we're going to add one to i and then do it again. And then as soon as i is no longer less than array length, we're going to stop doing this function, this, this loop. Now, all we have to do is just get the snake uh, cell inside of the snake cell's uh, array. So var snake equals snake cells, and then do the straight brackets directly next to that and put in i, so that'll get whatever item we're on. And then we're going to fill square snake.x, snake.y, and then I want my snake to be a green snake. And now, ta-da, we have a snake. It's only one little snake, but we have it, it's there. Okay, so this is basically where we got to last time, um, is just drawing these this snake on the screen. Um, the very next thing that we're gonna do is make it so that the snake moves, because why not, right? Um, first, I'm gonna make it so that the loop is going to make him move every now and then, and then, I'm going to make it so that we can change the direction using the arrow keys. So let's start with our loop function. Pretty much any game that you play that has continual action has a loop that runs all the time. The loop is going to make it so that stuff um, happens on a regular basis. In this case, it's going to be moving the snake on a regular basis. So I suppose instead of doing the loop, we need to do the move snake function first. Okay? Before we do anything else, let's set a direction for our snake. Let's make it so that the snake goes right. So to do that, we're just going to change x to be 1. This means that every loop, the snake is going to move one cell to the right. Okay? Now that we have that, we've got our direction, and what we need to do is move our snake. Um, since it's just one cell, it's actually going to be a little bit easier than if we have more than one cell. But I'm going to program it as if we had more than one cell. In order to do this, what I'm going to do is a loop. It's going to create a new snake cells object. Um, and it's going to update each of the previous cells to be whatever the last one was. I know this is kind of complicated. You know, it is kind of complicated. Let's just move one at a time. Um, yeah. So what we're going to do is another loop. For This one's going to be a little bit different, though. Var i equals... Actually, let's get our length first. Var array length equals snake cells dot length. And let's create a new array for our new snake cells. Var new snake equals empty array. Var i is going to equal array length this time. We're actually going to start at the end of our array and we're going to move to the front. Actually, no. Nope, that's not what we're going to do. Well, hmm. <laughs> Yeah, we actually do need to start at the front of our array and go to the end, so make that zero. And then i is less than array length, and then i++, okay? Now, 
we need to figure out what the first item of our array is going to be because that's the head of the snake. And the head of the snake is the one that's actually moving the rest of the snake. The rest of the snake is going to tail behind. So let's put an if statement in for if our i is zero. If i equals, always use three equals, it makes things work better later on. If it's zero, then what we want to do is set the x and the y of that snake value to um, whatever the x and the y value currently is plus the direction. So, and I, I think I'll get rid of new snake actually. Yeah, we'll get rid of new snake. Okay, so we'll do snake cells i and instead of creating a variable for the snake I'm just going to change it directly snake cells dot i uh, snake cells i dot x equals snake cells i dot x plus direction dot x so we're adding the direction to the first item of the array or the head okay and then we can do the same thing with the y. So snake cells i dot y equals snake cells i dot y plus direction dot y. Okay. Since that is currently zero, it's not going to go up and down at all. It's just going to go from left to right, like that. Okay. Awesome. Da -da -da. Now that we have that in place. That's just going to be for our first cell. If it's after that, then the cell, so we have the head here, and then we have the cell here, and what's going to happen is the head is going to move up one, and then this one needs to take the place of the head, and then the one behind that takes its place, etc., etc. So what we need to do here is do an else statement and say snake cells i dot x equals snake cells i minus one. So if the head is zero and this is one, zero moves up, and then one is going to take the place of one minus one or zero dot x. And then you do the same thing for y. Snake cells i dot y equals snake cells i minus one dot um, uh-oh, uh-oh, what this is going to do, hang on, this is, this is a problem, what this is going to do is it's going to move zero up here, and then one is just going to come and take where zero is, because zero is already up here. So we actually do need to make it so that it starts at the end and goes forward. So two is going to take the place of one, then one is going to take the place of zero, and then zero is going to move forward. So let's come up here and fix this. All that we have to do is just switch things around a little bit. i is going to be equal to array length, and then i is going to be greater than or equal to zero. So what we're going to do is we're going to go from array length, or the length of the array, all the way down to zero. We want to include zero because that's a cell that we want to actually work on. But um, once we get past zero, we don't want to worry about it. We want to stop the loop. And then we need two minus minus. Okay, so now what this is going to do is make two take the place of one, and then one takes the place of zero, and then zero moves into the next section. Awesome. Now that we have this move snake function, let's do our loop function. So there are a couple of ways of doing loops in JavaScript. What I'm going to do is make it so that this loop, this function, calls itself at the very end of it. So once the loop is done doing all the stuff inside of it, it's going to call itself again. But we don't want to call it immediately after because otherwise the, the programming will go too fast and it won't even look nice. Instead, what we want to do is have a little bit of a delay so that the snake moves in an animated fashion. That's what this delay function is up here for. 
That means we want to wait for 200 milliseconds, or about one-fifth of a second. So, in our loop function, in order to make it so that it waits for a bit, we'll use a special JavaScript function called setTimeout. Then we have to put in the name of the function that we want to call. In this case, it's loop. And then we put in the delay, or delay, just like that. So now it's going to continuously call loop over and over again, waiting 200 milliseconds in between loops. Um, now we need to do another thing, which is move the snake. So we'll call this function here. Okay, and then we need to call our loop. So let's loop. And it's not doing anything. Actually, if I come in here and set a console.log looping, it's going to run, and then maybe not. Is it not running? Hmm. Let's open up our browser console and see what's going on. Cannot read property X of undefined. Would you look at that? It's trying to do something. It's trying to get the snake cells for i minus one, but it can't find it. Let's see why that is. Oh, I know why that is. It's because what we're doing is, in this move snake, we're starting with i equaling array length. It has an, a length of one, but the first item is zero. So we actually don't want it to be i equals array length, we want it to be i equals array length minus one. And now, there you go, it's looping. And you can see that it's looping because it keeps writing the same message over and over again. That's annoying, so I'm gonna clear it. Oh no, it's more looping. And then I'm gonna get rid of that. But why isn't the snake moving? The snake isn't moving because we're not drawing again. Every time the snake moves, we have to draw it. Now, this is gonna look kind of funny when I do this because I'm missing something, but I want you to see this. Let me put the draw function right here after move snake. And then you'll see, oh, there it goes, except it's leaving a trail behind it, like, a, like it's slimy. That's no good. The reason for this is because the canvas doesn't just draw what you say to draw. It draws it and then keeps it there. So in order for this to look right, we actually need to clear the canvas. We can use a context function called ctx.clear uh, rect. And then here we're going to use an x value, a y value, so in this case 0, 0. And then we need to do a width and a height value, in this case uh, canvas.width and canvas.height. That's going to clear the entire canvas, so there's nothing there. And then it's going to redraw everything. Okay? Awesome. Um, so now that we have that, you, you just saw my snake wander off the page. Um, there he goes, woo, and he's gone, because he doesn't stop at the edge, which maybe we'll put in functionality for that later. Um, now that that's happening, we need to make it so that the direction can change. So, in order to do this, we have to create an event listener, okay? Let's talk about what an event is first. An event is something that happens. It's something that's triggered somehow. Um, in JavaScript, you can have events for lots of things, like when you click your mouse, that's an event. When you move your mouse, that's an event. When your mouse enters something, that's an event. When your mouse leaves something, that's an event. When you press the key down, that's an event. When you take your key finger off the key, that's an event. So we want to capture those events for the keys. Um, let's do another little Google thing. I'm going to Google for um, JavaScript arrow key event. And it's going to give me key events. Hey, detecting arrow key presses in JavaScript. So um, there's a lot of things here, but I think the best is this one right here. This function called add event listener. 
what it allows you to do is listen for when an event happens. So you, you can set up anything you want. In this case, we're going to set the document to listen, but it can listen. Uh, and then as soon as event, an event happens, it goes, oh, I should do something. It's going to call this function. And the function is going to have the event as an argument. And so you can look at the event and see what key was pressed. So let's do this really quick. Come here to your snake game starter and down here in init, at the very bottom, wherever you want it, type document dot add event listener listener make sure you capitalize it right the event that we're listening for is key down one word and then we're going to put a function that is that happens when this event happens so type function event and then we're going to console dot log event dot key Okay, in order for this event listener to work, you actually have to click inside of your canvas here, your web page, and then you can press your arrow keys. And notice, as I push the arrow keys, they show up in the console. Awesome! So we can use this to see what arrow is being pushed, and then change the direction to be based on that. So let's do that now. We're going to use the four if statements in order to do this. So if event.key equals arrow up, then direction equals x, 0, y, negative 1. The reason for that is because up is negative, and we want it to move one cell up every loop. So we're going to set it to negative 1. Arrow down. So now if the down arrow is pushed, we're going to do the opposite. X is going to be 0 and Y is going to be 1. Awesome. Arrow right. Right is positive 1 because that's the way that it goes. And left is the opposite direction, so we use net negative 1. Okay, there's that. So now, if I come in here, I'm going to hit save, and I'm going to restart my snake game by making a change in the code somewhere. And then, hopefully my snake doesn't go too far away, so that I can change the direction that he's going. Hey, there he goes! I can now move the snake around with my keyboard. Awesome. Okay, I think what I'm going to do is make it so that when the game starts, the direction is 0, 0. So that the snake just holds still, and then as soon as you hit the arrow keys, he starts moving. Okay? Awesome. So now, we can actually add logic to our game to make it so that instead of just being a green box running around, it actually does stuff when you eat the apples, for example. Um... Where should we put this logic? Let's put it inside of the move snake. What I want to do is make it so that when we move the snake, um, how would I do this? We need to add a cell to the end of the snake, right? And so that means that before this loop happens, we need to figure out what the end of the snake is. So let's do var snake tail equals snake cells array length minus one. That's the very last item of the array, right? Then we want to do this loop to move everything forward. But once everything's been moved forward, we want to stick another cell at the very end but only if we're on top of the apple, okay? So let's check and make sure that we're on top of the apple. In order to make sure we're on top of the apple, we just have to see if the head of the snake is in the same cell as the apple itself. So if snake cells zero dot x equals apple dot x, now we need to do two things the x and the y. So in order to check two things at once, we'll use an AND operator. 
The AND operator is with two ampersands like that. And what it does is it says if this right here is true, if snake cells.x is the same as apple.x, and if snake cells dot y is the same as apple dot y. If both of those things are true, then we're going to do the stuff inside the if statement. So what we're going to do is we're going to add another tail to the snake. So snake cells dot push, and we're just going to put the snake tail right back onto it. Snake tail. And then we also need to move our apple again. So let's run the place apple function. Okay, so now when our snake runs over the apple, it should get a tail. Oh, it didn't get a tail, but the apple did move. So something's happening, right? Okay, well, let's take a look at our browser console and see if anything weird's happening. Uh, nope. Looks like everything's working fine. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe. Yeah, looks like everything's working fine. Um, well then, in that case, let's console.log snaketail and see if snaketail is even a thing. Boom. It is. Boom. Uh, boom. Uh, boom. But for some reason, it's not actually sticking it in there, which is weird. Okay, so in that case, let's console.log snake cells when we run into the apple. So that's snake cells before, it gives me the location. And then here we'll do console.log snake cells. So we'll see before and after in our console. So if I run into this apple, boom. Oh, it's a circular object. Weird. That's weird. I've never seen anything like that before. Whoa, that's so cool. OK. Aha! What we're going to do instead is make snake tail into its own object like this, and then snake tail dot x equals that dot x, and then snake tail dot y equals that dot y. So this is just a weird thing that happens in JavaScript. I don't know why it happened. It's kind of weird, but we're just going to deal with it. So let's eat that apple again and see what happens. Boom! I've got a tail! I've got another tail! Awesome! So now, your snake can actually grow. So this is actually starting to turn into a half-decent game. Okay. Now we need to do one more thing in order for this game to actually work right. We need to make it so that if you run into yourself, you die, or if you run into a wall, you die, and the game's over. So what we should do is add some more checks into this move snake function, or maybe we'll make another, another function called check snake. Okay. So get rid of these console log statements because they actually slow things down a bit. So now if I move over here and eat the apple, it shouldn't be so slow. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, and then let's create another function right under move snake, right, at, right before draw, we'll call function check snake. What this function is going to do is it's going to check and make sure if the snake is um, inside of, if it's eating itself, or if it has run into a wall. So 
um, let's actually create another function too called reset game. And what this is going to do is call a couple of functions. We're going to um, set direction equal to zero or x zero, y zero. We're going to set snake cells equal to a blank array. And then we're going to place the apple again and place the snake again. So that way, when we, when we check the snake and see that he's out of bounds or wherever, we can reset the game easily. So let's do a quick check to see if the snake has run into himself. This is gonna be easy because the snake can only run into himself with this head, but we do have to do another for loop. So for var i equals one, because we don't wanna check if the head is running into itself because the head is the head. Um, i is less than array length, and let's make sure we get array length defined. This is snake cells dot length. And then we'll do i plus plus again. So if snake cells i dot x equals snake cells, or rather, yeah, snake cells zero dot x, and then we want to check the y too, so do the and snake cells i dot y equals snake cells zero dot y. So if the body part that we're checking has the same location as the head, then reset game. Now we need to run this check snake function during our loop, and we'll want to run it after the move snake function. So check snake is going to happen first. And yeah, that should be good. Boom. I can't run into myself when it's just little me, but now, oh, there we go. Wow, it worked, do you see that? Now that apple is somewhere over here outside. Because of the bug, see, I just ate the apple. And now I can go backwards. Oh, that didn't work. Now I can, yep, there we go, now I can go backwards. So when it's just two of me, I can go backwards just fine. But when it's three of me, I can't go backwards because then I die and the game's over. Okay, so now that that's working, let's make it, let's fix this bug first where you can go, where the, the apple sometimes spawns outside. The reason for that is because of the way that we're drawing this board. Um, this board actually, since it has a zero index, um, 15, x15, y15 is actually this square right here. So when we're placing the apple and placing the snake, we actually don't want to multiply it by 15. We want to multiply it by 14. So come here to the place apple and the place snake and make it so that it's multiplied by cell rows and cell calls um, minus one. And I just noticed I did this wrong. That needs to be cell rows instead of cell calls. So now the apple's never gonna go outside. We use this exact same method when we're checking the snake. So we need to check the head again. In fact, let me do this. Far head equals snake cells i. There, that'll make things easier. Uh, no, snake cells zero. So here, instead of snake cells zero, let's do head. And then here, let's do head head.x, head.y, awesome. Now let's check to see if it's outside of bounds. If head.x is less than zero, now we wanna check multiple things, but if any of them is correct, we'll reset. So if the head.x is less than zero, or do the bar thing. The bar key is right above the return key and you use shift to do the bar. So you'll do two bars, that's or. So if head.x is less than zero or head.y is less than zero or head.x is greater than 
or equal to, uh, let's see, cell calls or head dot y is greater than or equal to cell rows. Reset the game. Great. Now, boop, boop, oh, I'm really careful not to run into, there we go. So now if you run into the wall, you die. Just make sure it works in all directions. Awesome. Now, I think that's everything that we need for this game. There are a couple of other things that we could fix, like you just noticed the apple spawned inside of the snake. You might want to check and make sure that when you're placing the apple, you're not placing it on top of the snake. That would be weird. Um, but now our snake can run into itself. And, uh-oh, it's the game. I cannot read property X of undefined. What? Oh, I... I think I know why. I think it's because I don't know why that happened. That's weird. Hmm. That shouldn't have happened. Oh well. We've got this game now that we can play. So I'm going to give you a couple of other things that you can do. Um, as you can see, we aren't actually keeping score, so it would be awesome if you could keep score somehow and have a score that shows up. You could probably use HTML to display the score and use JavaScript to update the score whenever you get a point. Um, it'd be really cool if you could make it so that you can go through walls. Oh, there's that bug again. I don't know why that bug is happening, but... Yeah, so figure out how to fix these bugs because there are a couple of bugs and learning how to fix bugs is important. Um, maybe add a reset button. When you click the reset button, it does the, the reset game function. Um, make it so that when you go through a wall, instead of ending the game, you actually go all the way through the wall and to the other side. Um, there are a lot of things you can do. As of right now, you can do a couple of things because we made all of these variables here. So I can actually speed it up by making this a smaller number, like if I make it 50, then all of a sudden the game's gonna go really fast. Um, or I can make it really slow too. Wow, that's really fast. So you could make it so that the game gets more challenging the longer you get because the, the delay gets shorter. So it actually speeds up the game as you go. That would be cool. Um, and of course we can make it so that this game board is bigger. So if we wanted to, we could make it uh, 20 by 20. And now I have an even bigger game board to play. Or you could make it so that it spawns multiple apples or it spawns apples every now and then. So you have lots of apples on the board. Um, lots of things that you can do. Anyway, make whatever you want. And next time we have the Web Dev Guild, show us what you made. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the Web Dev Guild Discord chat. I'll make sure that links for, um, oh shoot, I've been saving to the starter. That's embarrassing. So I should probably erase all the stuff that I've been working on here. Um, I'm going to um, add links to the description for this and for the Discord. And if you need anything, go ahead and ask. So yeah, that's basically it. Um, have a good time gilding.